Entrepreneur Podcast. Dr. Chris Hardy and William Walker will take a deep dive into topics covering wellness and prevention, performance, recovery, and injury management. Our mission is to provide the latest science-based information to help you get the most out of your grappling journey, both on and off the mats, and help you overcome any challenges you may be grappling with. Dr. Hardy is a licensed physician and BJJ practitioner, but the contents of the podcast are meant for educational purposes only and should not be taken as medical advice. Please seek out personalized care from your own medical provider prior to implementing any medical treatment or intervention. Here we are. Yes. Our first question and answer yeah. podcast. Things are about to get real. Mm. Real people, real talk, <laughs> real time. That's what it is. Was this a reality show? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was trying to remember the real world. What What is it? What was the real world thing? Real people. Oh, dang. Completely scripted. <laughs> hey don't throw puck under the bus like maybe this. real people real situations no mm, this is embarrassing wow i practice this in the mirror and I that was forgot. a fail so question and answer episode mm-hmm. we got a lot of questions from people and we decided to just make an episode on that I think just, it's good. I think it's, it's going to go across a bunch of different things. and Well, especially after two podcasts of like heavy, you know, science-y stuff. Yeah, and, you know, Nerd Alert it, was heavy. Yeah, I think um, it's good. I, yeah, I think this this will be nice. And I don't know a lot of the questions that came in. Yep. Uh, you fielded some. I fielded some. And so we're going to go into a little cold. And I, I like it. That's the way and Olivia's go. picking them. So. Yeah. I'm digging she, it. She's picking over there. Um, that doesn't sound weird at all. <laughs> Shout out to you for something. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah. I want to congratulate you for successfully going through the process of creating an Instagram. (laughs) Can I get a round of applause, please? It's the yellow button. Oh. (laughs) Hey! Well, I was going to say that was just this morning. (laughs) Yeah. And I didn't understand how that worked. As soon as I signed up, my daughter pings me on a messenger and says, hey, are you on Instagram now? I'm like, what kind of black magic is this? You threw your phone. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, that was good. You haven't quite put a profile photo up. No. It's still the the, default. Anonymous. Anonymous thing. Dude, I need help. You have nine followers. That's amazing. I know. You're good. Your wife, me, Olivia, your daughter, you know, a couple of bots. Yeah, but I just came up this morning with it, so yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm happy. I do like that you have a number in your name also, which yes. is very fitting. You know, it's like Bill Walker, 1727. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very fitting. Mine's 52. Okay. I just picked it because it's my current age, and then I'll know when I first got on Instagram. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. That you have, well, this is my current age, and that'll remind me when I yeah. when I created it. Exactly. My <laughs> password is password fifty two. <laughs> um, yeah. But that's good. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I feel good. Yeah. We're very 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 happy. We're, we'll get that squared away. Okay. Um, so let's just dive right in. Uh, I think. I thought it was your birth year. That's sixty nine. I didn't want to put that. <laughs> <laughs> That's sweet. Right? <laughs> that would be like Christopher Hardy, 69. They'd be like, dude, are you born then? Or you what's going on with you, man? Horrific. Yeah. Your well, license is gone. Yeah. Um, yeah, let's just jump into some questions. What do you got, Livy? All righty. So first one is... They say they don't have a doctor. They have a nurse practitioner that they see. And they're trying to figure out what type of doctor looks at the body as a whole. So not one who's just going to give you the newest pill that ails you, but um, a doctor who's going to treat any issues as a whole. Any issues like um, whether it's like blood work or back pain or mental stuff like psychiatric and all that? Yes. You want me to take this one, Chris? If you would like, I have a rant prepared on this one. You know, I I'm a little out of breath after the intro, so why don't you just go ahead and go for it. So this is, I think, the 
you know, we, we, I think we touched on this a little bit last time. Um, I had a mini rant. Modern medicine has set us up for this problem um, where we have hyper-specialization. We look at people as a bunch of different organ systems instead of, you know, that, you know, as a person and treat them as such. Like you can go to a gastroenterologist for your, you know, GI stuff, you know, a dermatologist, a cardiologist, uh, you know, we could just keep going, orthopedist. Mm -hmm. No one's really trying to put it together. And the people that would, and then the best place to do this is like your family medicine doctor. Unfortunately, they're, most of them are under a system where they have to see a patient every 15 minutes, like we talked about last time. Mm -hmm. You can't do good medicine like that. And they try. There's some really good doctors out there that are really frustrated with the system. There are some folks that have gotten so frustrated, they've gone outside of the system, open up their own practices, and do things where, like called functional medicine or integrative medicine. You know, functional medicine by definition is like getting to the root of a problem, looking at all the organ systems as an interrelated thing and not like how one affects the other and mm -hmm. really trying to put the pieces together. Um, that's hard to find because of many things in, um, insurance reimbursements. I mean, you know, people are just trying to come big corporations that own most of the doctors are just trying to get people through the doors. Um, it's not a good way to do medicine. You end up doing disease management. Like here's a pill. Okay. We got to make sure your medications you're on are good. Here's some blood work. And by that time, that's 15 minutes is up and they're not delving into the things like, you know, sleep, stress, you know, or a really, really good medical history where we can see what, what this person is coming to us with. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm very, I actually am married to someone that does functional medicine mm -hmm. um, and she has her own practice. Um, but, you know, it's, it's challenging to the point where, you know, she's actually had to stop taking insurances because we couldn't even keep the lights on in that clinic if, you know, they're trying to pay her 30 or 40 bucks for a, hour long new patient visit you know she has staff to pay rent and all that <clears throat> so she couldn't literally could not take some of these insurances anymore but people are still they're paying cash for good for someone to sit down with them mm -hmm. the, the need is out there i think it's going to have to come from the ground up um people are going to start demanding that and you know and it's and actually putting some of their money down and and paying out of pocket for it, unfortunately. Um, so there are people out there, they, for, you know, varying degrees of um, expertise. I mean, you know, but it'd be more like a functional medicine or an integrative medicine. Is that doctor. something that you would, that's how you would go about looking for it, is yeah. you would Google functional, functional medicine. medicine and, clinic. you know, she's seen a nurse practitioner. And let me tell you, some of the best clinicians I've come across have been nurse practitioners. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think many of them want to do, I hate to use the word, that holistic type of care, but I mean, that's what they, you know, I, I think their, their model of training is based on that. Um, matter of fact, my wife is actually looking, um, was recently was looking for some, a nurse practitioner to join her in practice specifically. So there is nothing wrong with a nurse practitioner. They do mm -hmm. fantastic work. Um, it's just you want to get one with the right mindset. Exactly. It's the same thing. That's just their yeah. degree and what they've done, um, but still the same kind of functional medicine approach. And matter of fact, when I was doing my integrative medicine fellowship, um, there was a significant amount of nurse practitioners in my um, cohort, mm -hmm. in my training program. So, so <clears throat> you kind of just explained functional medicine mm -hmm. and what that means. What about integrative? Integrative medicine, there's some overlap. Um, integrative medicine is basically taking the best parts of modern medicine because there are some good parts on it. You know, mm -hmm. people don't die from infections much anymore. You know, mm -hmm. you know, orthopedics and trauma medicine is great. You know, there's some good parts of modern medicine and we shouldn't just throw them away because we're frustrated with the system. And there's also so-called alternative medicine approaches, you know, whether they're herbs, acupuncture, um, things like that that aren't used in mainstream medicine, but we don't just take those as face value and take them all in. They still have to have an evidence base and a science based, mm -hmm. you know, 
to them. So we're trying to take the best out of both worlds and typically integrate them. And it's also is very, very focused on prevention. Um, so during the tr program, we had, we looked at each kind of organ system mm -hmm. and uh, looked at a lot of preventative approaches, melding traditional contemporary medicine with some of the alternative medicine things to, to create a whole treatment plan. But we also focused on a lot of stuff like the, so, you know, like mindfulness, meditation, um, nutrition. We got a lot of formal, extra formal training in that too. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the prevention stuff instead of um, more of a, here's your drug for, you know. Sure. Yeah. Like what they were talking about. That's right. So, and you guys are kind of like an interesting hybrid. Someone call you a lichen. You remember that movie? Yeah. Which one? With the you. Underworld movies? Okay, you got Come it. Come on you now. Got it. You got it. You got it. Yeah. Um, where you work in um, um, the modern like clinics, right? I do. Like so, but your wife works in has an integrated medicine has her own practice. Yeah, yeah, own practice. But you actually are still working completely in um, the other side. Yeah, and a lot of that because um, I never want her to um, have to compromise what she's doing. Mm -hmm. So we we ha I have a job um, that pays the bills. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to worry about using money from her practice to right. kind of support her daily life. So right. um, it, it's working well and she's doing awesome So you can work. focus on quality. Absolutely. Yeah. But not everyone Not that has, you're not no, doing quality work in the other side. But, but for what she wants to do, yeah. you know, so, and she's really um, being, being very, very successful. And matter mm -hmm. of fact, a lot of people are dropping out of their, you know, the, not that they had bad doctors, mm -hmm. they're sick of the system. Yeah. Yeah. So they like someone to sit and listen to them. Right. And I, one of the reasons I just kind of point that out that you guys are uh, kind of like that is it's easy, I think, for some people to hear someone pushing because there's a little bit of a internal battle uh, with people that look at integrated medicine people or um, alternative medicine mm -hmm. and they just push it to the side. Well, and let's be honest, there's some of the people out there that are doing nonsense too. For sure. Okay. Right. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to give specific examples, but, mm -hmm. but I mean, there are some stuff out there that is absolutely, look, I don't need a bunch of randomized controlled trials and all this, you know, evidence-based medicine is great. I like evidence informed medicine. And as long as there, you got to look at every intervention as a risk benefit. You got to look at that. Okay. What are the potential risks of this treatment? What are the potential benefits? Uh, and also, is there biological plausibility? Does it make sense for what we know about physiology, biochemistry, and all that? Not just, hey, you know, this is some exotic thing that we just want to throw at someone and see mm -hmm. what works, right? So there's, with every intervention, you can talk to Carrie when she comes on a lot about that, how she approaches every intervention like that. Right. And we don't just take anything. Just because it's alternative doesn't mean it's good. Right. Okay. I had a perfect example. It's not the same thing, but I had a patient years ago arguing with me um, about nutrition. And this person wanted weight loss. And this person was like, well, but I'm eating gluten-free. I'm like, yeah, I know, but it's still crap. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. They, they, they focused on, well, but it's gluten-free. I know. That yeah. donut I had that was gluten-free. <laughs> right. I don't understand. I ate the whole row and I still felt like poop. That's my point. And that, that analogy is to like, just because it's alternative medicine doesn't mean it's all good. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you got to really be careful about yeah. what people, and there are people that advertise themselves as integrative medicine practitioners that really don't have a license that allows them to do full spectrum care mm -hmm. either. I'm not going to get into different sure, professions, sure. but yeah. And that, I think that's why, uh, like I was saying, why I want to bring up that you actually still work in that sector because some people, from what I've seen, someone that says no integrated medicine, functional medicine, that this is good. Like mm -hmm. it's almost it's like the political world where you say one thing that leans a certain way. Now you're com like you're looked at as being yeah. Only, you're all there. Yeah, yeah. Rather than well, mm, no, no, actually. <laughs> so the, the definition of integrative medicine. So a lot of people are are putting a placard on their practice and saying they practice integrative medicine. Mm -hmm. They're not. Is there a <laughs> way for? Uh, 
customer yeah. that's looking to un- know if they're one of those people or yeah. legit. Look at their training background. There's actually a fellowship in integrative medicine okay. that a, already a licensed physician or a nurse practitioner can go do. It's a two-year academic fellowship. It's pretty intense. Okay. Um, uh, functional medicine the same way. My wife's gone through a series of training um, these modules to get trained up in this stuff and they should put that you know yeah you know on their site and they should be someone that can do a pretty broad spectrum of medicine in general you know mm-hmm. um so you know someone that is uh, a nurse practitioner or a physician um in addition to that but that has this training that has this approach yeah yeah okay if that uh, helps. but it's hard to I find so. right and then you have to i know i know in carrie's clinic she says people that have come to her that have tried like two or three different people and mm-hmm. it just wasn't a good fit. And you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So you gotta, you gotta be willing to do that too. Got, got you and experiment a little bit. Yeah. Livy. Yes. Hit us with the next one. <laughs> All righty. Why are thyroid issues on the increase? Is it diet based? Has research been done on why? And is it related to particular foods or additives to the American diet? That is an awesome question. I'll take a little short swipe at it, but I would like my spouse to answer that question. If we can hold that for her when she talks about hormones. Yeah. Uh, Well, speaking of that, we're going to have Carrie on in probably two weeks two or three weeks yes like that. oh yeah two two or three weeks we'll we'll, we'll be uh, having her on and we're gonna talk thyroid we're gonna talk um, testosterone testosterone we're we're gonna have her on a couple times so women's health women's health whether uh-huh. it's pcos uh estrogen like yep we're gonna go deep yeah and i'm gonna intro her with all of her academic credentials and just try to make her blush a little bit She'll probably smack you with a rubber glove. Remember, her side control is pretty rough too. Yeah, so. the press. Yep. <laughs> so, so okay, we'll defer on that one. Well, I, I'll just real quick on that because I yeah. don't want to gloss over. It. So, I haven't looked at the epidemiology of okay, is there an in fact? Um, so, when you look at if cases are on the rise and whatever, you got to look at are we looking for it more, mm. or is it truly, you know, right. increasing in, in prevalence and incidence? Um, you know, there are a bunch of endocrine disruptors in uh, the environment, um, plastics, all kinds of different things. Um, a, there is a subsection of thyroid disorders that are autoimmune, like Hashimoto's, that we're seeing more and more start with, believe it or not, our GI tract, where most of our immune system is. Um, so thyroid disorders are not just a... Um, homogenous thing they're they're different types and um i was i'll see what she has to say about you know whether she feels like it's truly increasing or we're just looking for it more. Mm, okay yeah that's a good question we will get back to it can i actually ask a follow-up question of course why is it that it's more prevalent in women than men yeah and i think again carrie actually did some graduate work in environmental estrogens and autoimmunity okay. and i would have i don't want to speak out of turn because it's not my expertise but i i believe there is an estrogen component to that i but i don't really know the details of it okay um but yeah they but, could but, just make it more susceptible to yeah there's certain yeah okay. i mean there are certain there are definitely um certain diseases that are more prevalent in men versus women or women versus men mm-hmm. and that seems to be one of them Okay. Okay. All righty. Hit, hit us with number three, Dale. <laughs> That's a terrible right. Cockney accent. What'd you call me? <laughs> <laughs> I'll fly right over this table, <laughs> attack you like a monkey. <laughs> okay. Um, so, next question What is the optimal pre class fuel or rolling fuel? Um, as in. Your carbs, protein, fat ratio. Um, this person says that they do not generally eat breakfast or lunch. And an example of what they had was a glass of chocolate milk and a Costco fruit stick. And they said that they felt much more energy and in, 
endurance and they're curious what your go-to is. Yeah. Okay. That talks about pre-workout nutrition. Sounds like my people. Yeah. I was going to say, is that someone related <laughs> to you? <Yeah. laughs> hmm. So, um, you know, there's been debate over the, you know, what's the optimal pre intra or post workout nutrition. And a lot of the work has been done in aerobic, uh, you know, like long distance endurance activities, which has a different requirement than grappling. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're more related to a sprinter, right? Kind of. If, we, if also, we were going to be, I yeah, guess, but even then. More of a middle range. distance okay. kind of right, with a strength component too. Sure. It's a tough one. Mm -hmm. um, the bottom, what you want to look at is, you know, how much muscle glycogen is being emptied by your, you know, how, how much we're going into the anaerobic. For the workout that you're doing. Yeah. Okay. So it depends. It's one of those. It depends. We'll for, stay with grappling. For grappling. Yeah. So first of all, someone that doesn't eat breakfast or lunch is like, oh yeah, weird. You gave yourself a little carbohydrate, mm -hmm. and I bet you do feel better. And a little sugar. And well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so just to be clear, sugar, sugar is a carbohydrate. It was a test. You passed. I, know, I thank you. I pray. Why would you set me up like that? I mean, because I got to <laughs> keep you on your toes. So, um, but yes, yeah, someone like that probably doesn't have their glyco glycogen topped off. They're coming into it already, you know, not really ready to do that kind of activity. And, yeah, it's not surprising that they get, even those are, I wouldn't call those optimum mm -hmm. things to use for, but they're still basically sugar and a little bit of protein in that milk. Do you think maybe, I mean, I assume they've experimented a little bit and maybe they, for when they've had a lunch and mm -hmm. they had, um, you know, whatever, a basic, you know, Lunch could be teriyaki or, or uh, you know, tacos or something like that. And maybe yeah, they yeah. didn't feel quite as good. Sure. I, I would have to ask them some more questions. But yeah. if, they, if they're saying they're not eating breakfast or lunch and then going into rolling fasted, mm -hmm. it's a terrible idea, is my opinion. Especially in end of day. Yeah, exa rolling, exactly. Yeah. In, in my opinion. And then they got something, oh, I, wh whatever it was, mm -hmm. some kind of fuel is going to make mm -hmm. them feel better. So, but as far as ratios and all that, this has been talked about in the literature for a long time. Um, there's so many, there are so many um, components to this. I mean, do you, how soon do you take it in before your training, mm -hmm. especially grappling what we're doing? Mm -hmm. I mean, you imagine if you loaded up on food like half an hour before or, you know, Mm -hmm. That's probably not a good idea to either. Some okay. people can do that. I would. They can, but you, you're fighting against what the what our systems are supposed to be doing. Because when you eat something, you're you know you need peristalsis and all that parasympathetic activity of the nervous system for digestion and all that. And then you're telling the body, "Well, I'm going to do a flight or fight type of activity at the mm -hmm. same time." Mm -hmm. And it's like you're not going to get really good digestion. Yeah. And so I don't. I think at least you know give yourself at least a couple hours. Right. Before, I, I think, um, and how much in the ratio, I typically just do like a, a, a carbohydrate protein. Um, I don't think, you know, people will say well, there's a... See, I hear th that sentence, yeah, and it almost means nothing to me. Yeah. So when you say a carbohydrate... And, and some protein. To me, like how I just did with the sugar thing. Yeah. Like... You say carbohydrate. I I'm thinking, I'll just rice. Mm -hmm. It was just starch. French fries. Yeah, French fries is starch, but with probably some nasty. bananas. Okay, bananas is another good one. Reese's Pieces. Yep. Pad Thai. Sure. Lucky Charms. Yep. These are carbs to me. Um. So when you say carb and soda? a protein, I I don't I, I just don't even understand what. So you're you could saying. do, for instance, let's just do something that would be easily digested. And I always, for me anyway, okay. if I'm going to do something pre-workout, I don't want something hanging around in my stomach and just not being, you know, taking a long time and a lot of energy to digest. Like, um, you know, a big a, a steak and some, you know, a big heavy meal probably mm -hmm. wouldn't be a good idea. Mm -hmm. I would typically, if I'm doing it solely for pre-workout, um, I would do something like, you know, you could do even like a little whey protein and add some honey. Okay. You know what I mean? Something yeah. super simple like yeah. that. That works better for me. 
or some whey protein in a banana mm -hmm. or half a banana. But again, there's a fiber component in that too that can cause in a banana that can cause some. It'll take energy. Well, and some GI problems too for some people if yeah. they're trying to do. It's not going to clear as rapidly as something like um, honey or something a, a simple sugar is okay. what honey is, and, and that simple sugars are carbohydrates as well. Mm -hmm. So all those starches are broken down into glucose. Yeah, and sugar is usually a combination of glucose, fructose, right. and sucrose, and that's why I think differentiating between you know whether it's a starchy carb or whether yeah. it's a sugary carb or whatever that's yeah. that's kind of important. that's a no it's a good question um and it's good to point that out um pre-workout depending on what you're like again what you're doing grappling having someone do knee on belly on you, you know mm -hmm. what i mean i mm -hmm. mean i just i feel like if you have a lot in your belly still yeah, yeah. yeah. i so but you should, but from an energy perspective it's helpful yeah but it also begs the question of what were your glycogen stores and what was your meal prior to that so if you're coming in fasted yeah you pretty much eating anything is going to make you feel better mm -hmm. but if you've been well fed and you've had good refeeds before your glycogen's probably up pretty well right now so you probably need less of that mm. um you know, and again, a lot of the research is a little muddy because it's, there's so many variables involved yeah. of what the research is, for whatever reason, is done on, like I said, on endurance athletes. Um, there's been some on strength training, but we're kind of a combination of a lot of things and a very energy, um, uh, you know, we're using a ton of energy yeah. when we're doing these things. Live, so live. For pre for pre-workout. So I don't think there's a good... You're going to have to experiment. I definitely think there's an, a, a benefit to getting the protein, which then you know is broken down to the, its component amino acids, mm -hmm. and something easily to digest carbohydrate will certainly could help your yeah. your rolling, depending on what you're <laughs> what you're coming in with. Sure, if that makes sense. I I eat. I have a similar eating schedule uh -huh. as this person. Um, what are you snickering about? That's call that's the I'm calling BS snicker. That's what that is. <laughs> okay. It's what it sounded like to me. I don't know for sure. We'll get there. <laughs> so what a, what do you like to eat pre pre jujits? I or have you experimented, thought about it, or care? I don't really eat food pre jujitsu mm -hmm. like I have my lunch and mm -hmm. then because I know that it takes a little bit of time for um food to digest I th what is it like two two and a half hours or two hours or something it depends like that. on what you're eating yeah, yeah for like it to like half empty or something yeah so but there's nothing I mean, specific that you're kind of like I I want I like having some grapes I like you know I mean if I was going to pick something I guess it would be like maybe a fruit yeah, like an orange like or something yeah, like that. Like a, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, and but she's. This is a point. This is exactly the point I was bringing up. She's coming in, haven't eaten lunch already. Mm -hmm. So when she hits, you know, jujitsu at, you know, most of us are doing dinner time. Yeah. She's already had some food. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't eat in the morning, uh, except for I. It's my own personal little treat. I know that there's like the whole keto thing and like being fast and all that. But I like having a little bit of fruit in the morning. It's almost like a pick me up. Mm -hmm. I love having a banana just right out the gate. Mm -hmm. um, maybe some cantaloupe or watermelon or something like that. Some sort of fruit. To me, it's like a treat. It's perfect. Though. So I do that in the morning. Um, and then. Typically, I, I, I've been off coffee for like two weeks, but mm -hmm. uh, typically I'll do a, some coffee with, as we know, some very heavy cream. Um, About two cups worth. <laughs> so you have a little coffee with your cream? <laughs> yeah, okay. basically. Um, I have trimmed that since you guys shamed me <laughs> on that. And See, for those of you, shaming works. Fat shaming <laughs> works. For sure. And you guys did it, and you're a physician, and you should be ashamed. <laughs> so... Uh, it worked, and I was doing probably a, w less than a quarter of what I was doing, and it immediately felt better. Um, it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, the bloating went down a little bit. So, um, and I sweetened those with monk fruit and stevia. Mm -hmm. But uh, 
I don't typically eat throughout the day unless it's a couple candy bars. Um, You're hurting my feelings right now. This is life in the real world. <laughs> so believe it. So I uh, will do that. Or when I am actually living a little healthier, I'm only doing just a little bit like uh, beef jerky or something like mm -hmm. that instead of candy bars. Mm -hmm. And so I haven't eaten much. I just had a little bit of fruit in the morning and then maybe a little bit of sugar or uh, protein in the middle of the day. Uh, and then I personally feel like I can't eat like within three hours of training. Mm -hmm. It's just, I will start feeling it come up and that's what I'm talking about. It even an hour and a half, if I'm an hour and a half, mm -hmm. I am playing with fire mm -hmm. and I just know it, especially if it's anything that's like hearty, like, you know, uh, has some substance to it. Um, so I, but I started noticing within that little window I do have that that's within that three hour window. If I do have a little bit of fruit, I do feel better. And I wasn't sure if that was like a, like a blood sugar thing. Like, yeah, you know, as we're exerting ourselves, like I don't get that kind of like lightheadedness. Well, for sure. Stuff that, like that. That's what I'm talking about. Right. You, yeah. you know, you, you need to give that f some fuel and, uh, grappling is a very, pretty much a, pretty high glycolytic in other words sugar burning type mm -hmm. of you know activity mm -hmm. and so absolutely if with that you know i'm not endorsing your your candy bar as an optimum thing but right you know <laughs> you're still get the bottom line is you're I might still, eat it right now you should you're get it but you know eating that little bit of fruit, if i eat it in front of you do you get fatter <laughs> i might damn oh. i don't know it doesn't even appeal to me not even a little bit. Not even a little bit. You don't bit. want to just sniff it? Nope. I've now, just looking at a wrapper, I'm like, ugh. A wrapper? Yeah. Did you grow up in USSR or was it more <laughs> no, Eastern? It's just, no. It's just over time, I know I don't feel good when I do stuff oh, like that. And I've, now guys. I have an association with that. Okay. You're scarred. Yes. You've been touched. I'm in your soul. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. I have issues. What's is wrong with you? <laughs> so, um, but yeah, of course you're gonna you're gonna feel better if you do mm -hmm. that. You like what Olivia right. is doing is more optimal. Uh huh. You know, she's eating a, a, a decent lunch already, right? And so she's not n having the need to do that as okay. much. Um, you're not. But I do feel good. I, I feel like I can do multiple rounds. Yeah. Now, I think a bigger part of that, uh, because when I was uh, a lower belt, mm -hmm. I was more overweight. I was overweight. I was 230 pounds, basically, and, mm -hmm. and uh, out of shape and stuff. So rolling, like doing back-to-back -back rounds was just like almost not an option. Cause I right. didn't. But I, I almost lump a bigger factor than being like in shape now to then is my economy of movement in jiu-jitsu is so it's kind of hard to tell you're exactly right and that's another component too where at at your our our belt level hopefully we have more economy of movement we're not you know our energy, struggling yeah, yeah we're a lot of energy conservation yeah absolutely as opposed to someone brand new that's still you know mm -hmm. kind of but even if i do like you know you get that stretch of four rounds in a row with yeah. really hard rolls uh, all upper belts or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you're getting, you know, a really good pace and all that kind of stuff. I still feel, um, I, I feel like I can do it now. I don't know if there's a question about this later, but pre-workout, like, uh, the powdery stuff. Yeah. Is there a question about that? Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same question. Though. Okay. You know, so I, I, and I think it's more of a habit and ritual kind of thing because obviously my, uh, caffeine tolerance is very good because I crush caffeine. Mm -hmm. Um, I it's almost like I like I need one of those, and it's not for like a little pick me up. It's almost like just habit. Like I drink it on the way to jujitsu. Something that has caffeine in it. Does that have caffeine in it? Yep. So caffeine is an, a known performance enhancer. Absolutely is. It mobilizes blood sugar. I mean, yeah. I mean, 
Yeah, so, so when people ask if I'm steroid Bill, I say I am caffeine Bill. That's fine. But you know, caffeine Bill or cocaine Bill or methamphetamine Bill oh, God, yeah. typically starts looking a little emaciated and mm. so okay. it looks a little different. Okay. <laughs> okay. But but I mean if you it depends on what you did the night before too. Did you get a good refeed? Are you mm. you know, your muscle because remember the the liver will kind of take in and divvy out blood sugar all the time. It's like a banker takes in, pushes right, out. Right. Where the muscle, once you kind of replete it and you don't use it in the muscle, it's going to stay there. Okay. So if you had a really good refeed previously, topped off your muscle glycogen, that's a reservoir now that you can work with. Um, so it, it depends. We're <clears throat> noticing that I pretty much eat once a day for the most part, and it's after training. Yeah. But. I'm not shy about it. Right. Boy can take down quite a few pieces of pizza. Right, but you're refeeding what you need. You you have a you basically have a, um, a restricted feeding window. Mm. Otherwise, intermittent fasting, whatever you want to call it. But you're doing an adequate refeed, and so you're topping off the muscle glycogen. What what the pre workout would do for you? Give you a little bit of sugar mm. for some like ready fuel like readily available mm. where you're not having to break down the muscle glycogen and all mm. that they give you a little more okay um, yeah so um you can get away with a lot also um yeah when you're younger um it takes you know the systems just don't work as well as you you, you might find as you age doing this you're gonna maybe need to support it a little more mm. and really plan your training days with your feeding like yeah. you know okay i'm training this day you know, maybe I'll do a little fruit in the morning, mm -hmm. right? Just kind of support that. Gotcha. I think you'd probably perform a little better. So going um, back to their question. Yeah, there's there's no, I mean, you'll see in the literature all the time. Here's the, and you'll see advertised on different sports powders. Oh, here's the optimum ratio for repleting muscle glycogen. It is, they work, protein and, and, and sugar work you know carbohydrate work well together to mm -hmm. to kind of support uh, performance and also recovery and with this person with their question it's almost look they need to look a little farther back than just the morning that's right so what did they do the, the night before? before did you refeed well yep they sure do and if and play with it if they're feeling good um i would suggest maybe doing something a little less processed <laughs> mm -hmm. you know like like you're doing like some fruit or mm -hmm. something like that um and play around with it um and see how you deal with it but yeah uh, yeah it's it's a good question it's a um i don't even mind a, like one piece of toast yeah and it well, like i said i i don't want to have that i i gotta have a couple hours yeah but um a piece of toast and a banana or something like that yeah you're pretty much it's gonna be individual yeah. You're going to find out how long you have to mm -hmm. need because you're right. There's nothing worse having something in, trying yeah. to digest in your stomach while you're trying to roll. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, yep. I have a follow-up question with this. What about intra-workout, uh, like um, mm -hmm. amino acids or things to dis to support you? Yeah, they've they've studied that as well, too, and given a little bit of re some fuel while you're you're basically supporting your activity during it a little bit. Again, you got to you got to watch how much you're doing. Mm. Like what I'll do, I actually have a, um, a thing you've probably seen me drink at the Academy where I'll take between rounds. I'll go and take a couple sips. It's an amino acid thing mm -hmm. with, um, so I just, I want to give, give the muscles kind of a ready supply. Um, a little bit of carbohydrate. I have noticed once, once you put us on, um, adding salt and mm -hmm. like, magnesium, right yeah well, potassium. Potassium, potassium sodium magnesium to, to our waters yeah. during training yep so when situationals end mm -hmm. or something like that and we're about to go into rolling so we just did 15 minutes of pretty exertive workout mm -hmm. we're about to go into an hour of you know rolling once we started adding you know we use element mm -hmm. uh, it's just you know we like the flavors and stuff like that it's good um L M N T. Correct. And it, uh, I feel maybe it's placebo, maybe not, but it, it feels better. It's not placebo. You're, yeah. you're maintaining hydration is what you're doing. It's really important. Yeah, that was, that was 
it no it was noticeable for me and i think even for you live right oh for sure yeah when super helped with um maintaining like a grip strength or you know my my leg muscles were so fatigued when i was cramping wasn't. also well I, of course i haven't had so if i cramp it's going to be my uh calves because your boy got a set of calves on him mm -hmm. hashtag blessed <laughs> and then um my hammies mm -hmm. the hammies i haven't been getting cramps that's right and that's you're maintaining hydration you're keeping that i'm post-metapausal right. <laughs> <laughs> no more it's not those type of cramps dude tomato tomato okay <laughs> next question Okay, <laughs> that's where we're going. Okay, um, next question. Kind of a follow-up to that one. What is the optimal post-class rolling recovery um, like intake? How many carbs should someone eat? Uh, this person eats about three bowls of rice and half a box of cereal. <laughs> three bowls of rice. Yeah. <laughs> So they're <laughs> roughly half a box of cereal. Yeah. You want to be specific on that. Yeah. And they're wondering, is there a limit? <laughs> and also they would like to add donuts to the mix. Wouldn't we all? Um, and then how, how soon after training do you need to, you know, take that uh, glucose in? Like, yeah. is it within 30 minutes, an hour, two hours? Mm, yeah. And Fortunately, I'm somewhat of a donut connoisseur. Gas station donuts. No, I, I get yeah. it. Okay, yeah. so yeah. Good, you can where were you going to go with that? I just want to put it out there that fortunately he's asking the right podcast. So you're humble bragging about your donuts. Pure brag, no humble. Okay, okay. You can go so, and so, well, well, thank you, Bill. So again, with that, <laughs> I didn't hear a lot of protein with that um, post uh, mm. post workout. Mm -hmm. uh, three bowls of rice and half a box of cereal uh, may be excessive. Um, Again, if you listen to what we did with Brittany, when she was monitoring her post-workout and she was underfeeding. Do we know if this person has ever monitored? We don't do know. Okay. So I would suggest to figure out what they need is to monitor that and kind of see where they're at mm. as far as that. But they definitely need some protein with that. And I would also, you know, the half a box of cereal, I don't know what their, what kind of cereal it is. I'm assuming, you know, like a... Lucky Charms or Count Chocula. Would it matter a whole lot? I mean, what cereal would make a big difference from... They're all uh, kind of crappy. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's still raw material. If it, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of starch in it. You know, all those flakes and... Yeah, a that. lot of milk too, huh? Yeah, I don't know what they're doing with that. Mm. It's not necessarily bad. But, you know, I would definitely want some more protein in that. Um, and then they can look to see how much carb they actually need. Mm. with some if they go back and listen to the podcast we did with Brittany, especially the second one we mm -hmm. did with her and kind of monitor that and see what their blood sugars are doing after that massive you know three bowls of rice half a box of cereal yeah shoot i mean they may it depends on who you are if you're a you know yeah if you're 260 pounds with abs you have that much muscle mm -hmm. maybe you do or at least you can you can do it and it's not going to be that bad <laughs> as in it's not going to be it's not you're not optimizing no but it's going to treat you differently than it would me yeah yeah uh but but and then i think that go, I'm, were you gonna say something well else? i was gonna say if someone asked me this question like if i was sitting on matt's side mm -hmm. and someone was like man i'm just crushing some bowls of rice and lucky charms or cocoa puffs or mm -hmm. whatever is that cool I, I would say if you're going to eat that stuff, that's the time to eat it. For sure. Like if that's like your thing, like how candy bars is my thing or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, but if you are tr truly have a goal, you're going to have to change that a bit. You're going to have Likely. to. Likely. Yeah. You're going to have to get the protein thing. It's like the most glaring thing. Yeah, right? for sure. Um, and as we talked about, I think um, one of the questions, or maybe it was Brittany, uh, was, you know, don't try not to make your protein just the powder shake thing. That's right. You know, try to get some actual uh, real, real protein in you. Mm -hmm. um, and 
try the rice thing i imagine is the best of all the things he's mentioned whether it's donuts mm -hmm. or you know <laughs> right uh, uh cereal um but if this happens to be the same person that's also talking talking about the last question mm -hmm. then that starts to kind of create what well, you know the uh the full spectrum that we're seeing here of why they might be also gassing <laughs> right if if they're going full-blown carb no protein right sh sugary carbs also no protein then fasting essentially mm -hmm. during the whole day and then not if they, a lot of fats either yeah like pre yeah, very little yeah uh, maybe a little dairy and and then they try to do their jujitsu work i know i would also say is they have to look at their jujitsu training. Mm -hmm. Are they someone that is, when they train, they did three rounds over an eight round, nine round session. So that means they took a lot of rounds off. Mm -hmm. and they did three, five or six minute rounds in total. Now, we know from my question with Brittany, you know, was she getting the shakes after mm -hmm. just because she typically does two or three rounds and then she's done. But her two or three rounds are pretty very hard. hard, very hard. That's right. Um, so they have to look at themselves because if they could be making it even worse, if when they do their couple rounds that they're actually not putting, they're not really challenging their system, their body. They're not emptying all that glycogen. That's they're, right. And then they do that. Right. Now they're really stacking the chips against and them. And that is, that is my point about actually monitoring, you know, looking at is, are you disposing of all that glucose after? Well, you know, mm -hmm. is it still, are you overshooting? With the empty and the glycogen, can mm -hmm. we typically go off our, the little bit of hand? That's shooting. a nervous system thing typically. Like, hey, dude. Is there a way like the glucose monitor to like be like, okay, I, I, I did it. I'm good. Yeah. Not it's almost like you got to think about your perceived exertion. It's really hard to do. Mm. I mean, they've done some in the labs. They've kind of shown different workouts will empty this amount of glycogen, but there's no easy way to kind of tell. Okay. Yeah. Um, po post glucose monitoring is like a surrogate. Mm -hmm. You know, are you, are you refeeding it enough? You know, if you're, yeah. if you're refeeding and then you're two hours later, you're at 50, <laughs> you probably didn't, mm -hmm. you know, um, cause your, your, uh, muscles are still pulling yeah. blood sugar yeah. from the, from the, you know, from the blood into the muscle. So you probably haven't given it enough, right? You have to play with it. Um, but that just doesn't sound like an adequate recovery type of thing. You know, I mm -hmm. would definitely get, like you said, get a, a good, cause protein and carbohydrate work together mm -hmm. to help the recovery process. Mm -hmm. Especially if they, if they have any sort of goal of maintaining or increasing strength mm -hmm. then they're really missing that opportunity to put some protein right into the old beef well that protein is the building blocks to rebuild muscle mm -hmm. that you've kind of you know done a lot of damage to right yeah, and if you're and if you just underfeed can, over time you're going to crash and burn the wheels right. are going to fall off right so you can have your donuts too yeah but take a couple bowls of rice out have one donut half as much cereal and replace all the stuff you just took out with some good grade a beef you can but again if you're gonna do that that's the time to do it like mm -hmm. you said i'm not saying that's an optimal way to get the right that was refeed. bill talking that was bill and i understand mm -hmm. yeah timing yeah what's so they, the window they used like? to, yeah they used that whole anabolic window mm -hmm. type of thing um, that's been under debate now for a while. They used to say, oh, you got to do it within 30 minutes. And it mm -hmm. said, oh, you're fine within two hours. Um, or it's useless. It's gone. Yeah, it's 30 gone. minutes, it's gone. And that's not true. I think there's a good review article I just read um, that instead of thinking about it as a window, they, they use a really good um, analogy. They call it more like a garage door. So mm. there's, a, there's a longer, slower period where you can still get benefit. Now, it's always helpful if you can to refeed. You know, I always like to refeed soon after for recovery because mm. I don't want to get a big stress response going. Because if you don't, re if you wait, you know, long, let's say you don't eat anything mm -hmm. after a real hard rolling session, your body's going to like, hey, man, we got to make some glucose from s somewhere. Sure. 
if you don't provide it the fuel, it's going to go into a stress response and try to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So I try to prevent that. Um, of saying, you know, I think as a good rule of thumb, I mean, we should be eating, especially at night, we should be eating something afterwards. I mean, I don't think they're, the, the anabolic window of two hours, 30 minutes and all that has been under debate in the literature for a long time. Does it really exist? Is it really? But I think from a pragmatic point of view, just from physiology, you should refeed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whether it's, you know, I personally do it as soon as um, matter of fact, what I've been doing recently, what I feel a little better is I have a per, not a long drive home, but it's over 30 minutes from the Academy to home at night mm. after training. And I've started taking an orange with me and just getting a little carbohydrate on the drive home. Mm -hmm. It makes me feel better. That feels so good. When I get a little yeah. bit of fruit, I, obviously yeah. I crush fruit, but yeah. when I get a little bit of fruit after training, it makes me feel, I, I don't even think about candy bars. I turn into you. Well, I know. Oh, that's, <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. I can barely get up the steps. It's amazing. Your hair is graying and yeah, well, all of a sudden they're sending you AARP cards. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God. It's, it's I'm amazing. sorry, Bill. I start having flatulence like crazy. <laughs> I can't even control my bowels. Yeah, man. The pins are just around the corner. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, but I agree with you. And But then, you know, when I do get home, then I'll get a, a good bit of protein and, and mm -hmm. probably a little more carbohydrate. And mm -hmm. I, I seem to be doing real well with that. I'm staying relatively lean. What's a quick, quick protein? A quick, you don't, you mean, what do you mean quick? I mean, like... You, you, there's someone that wants to get to bed pretty quick. What's oh. a, what's a nice quick little thing that they can take in? I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. So, if we're, I always say real food is better. Mm -hmm. um, the quickest would be something pre-digested, right? I don't think that's necessarily optimum. I don't understand what you just said. Pre-digested. It sounds like, like someone else already ate it. Well, that's what like whey protein. Like you're gonna bird feed. In other it. words, that protein's already been broken down and it's. You know, it's, in other words, a steak, you have to, oh. your body has to digest that, extract the protein. So that's digested. Yeah, basically. Okay. If you think about that. I'm not saying someone digested it, but it's it's the same. It's already been broken right. down. It's ready for you. The machine digested it, and now it's yes, in a bin waiting for you. That's right, waiting for digest. I personally, um, you know, you can do something like, um, you know, we we have a local butcher Mm -hmm. that we use that have you know we we really try to support our local farmers mm -hmm. and the meats better we just picked up a little bit right so we do we get some hamburger meat something like that that's already and that's been broken down so mm -hmm. you know some of that connective tissue's already been broken so yeah, we cook we typically will cook like two or three pounds put it in a yeah a bin in the fridge and then we I mean, can just super easy is you know hamburger meat season it up mm -hmm. and put some um and a little bit of rice. I mean, it's yeah. really quick. Yeah. So Olivia likes to also buy those little like five dollar roasted chickens from Costco. Yep. And then we like peel it apart. Yep. Put it in a bin and put it in the fridge, and then perfect. If you're not, if you're tired of the ground beef, then you can do it. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. But you know, a steak is great. Um, it's going to take a little longer to digest because it's all the connective well, tissue. Once again, I was more so considering a time thing as sometimes you're tired you just you know you got to get protein you care about it yeah but having a quick something quick is well it's also planning you know like we'll mm. well at times we'll cook something up and like you've done and store it and then mm -hmm. when we get home we can basically just heat it up got it yeah but yeah, it's really important to get that so again that whole people are like what's the optimum this and that okay yeah, what's your, it, yeah it, the research is kind of um, all over the place and it depends on what you've um, what sport you're talking about and what your okay. demands are okay yeah so well, don't don't overcomplicate it mm, <laughs> I guess it's just a, get that. good stuff in yeah well I so I kind of want to ask a follow-up question on that well two things one is if you did test your blood sugar and it was 50 or something like that right after you did a um, post meal or post workout meal. You mean like two hours afterwards? Yeah. Um, should you immediately go and eat some more carbohydrates then at that point? You could. Okay. You can refill your muscle glycogen a little more. It'd be better to notice that and then your next refeed do a little more. 
during your refeed. So you're saying you got out of jiu-jitsu at 8, you eat pretty much right away, it's 10.30, you're maybe considering going to bed soon, and yeah. you test it, and you're like, hmm, I'm at 50, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't come into that situation. I mean, you know, trying to eat and digest at that time, it might be difficult. Maybe, maybe the better thing is, okay when I train tomorrow or the next day, I'm going to do more when I do refeed. That's right. Rather or than you, try to fix it in that moment. Yeah, or if you were to do that, you could do something that is really easily digestible, like some you know, some honey or something like that. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Something that's already ready to go. Yeah. So you're not like tying up, you're you know, trying to digest food while you're, while you're sleeping. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, and then the other one was is, I've heard, and I know you're talking about how the, you know, the research is still kind of out there, but that you need to take in a certain amount of protein, let's say 30 grams post-workout has to be within 30 minutes or else you're not going to hit that mTOR pathway. Yeah, that's just not true of what we found. Um, And again, you got to look at those articles and look at what their subjects were, who they were, what they were doing. That's that anabolic window I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. That anabolic window, like I said, they used to say within 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then they said, no, no, two hours is fine. And some people like, no, up to four hours is fine. Well, you got a strength (laughs) Olympic lifter and then you have an endurance runner and a CrossFit guy. Exactly. Um, I think um, getting some protein, there's nothing wrong with getting some protein as soon as you can afterwards just to hedge your bets. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's a hard, fast rule that you're not going to hit the the mTOR pathway like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Does it need to be a certain amount? So again, yeah, it depends on, you know, what's your body size. Um, that's, that's you have your little rule of thumb that you like to go by, right? Yeah. Which is double your weight. Well, in protein grams. Well, that's for the full day. That's for the full day. I mean, you know, it depends on your act, your activity level, how much you want it, how much you need. There's again, this is you're asking a good question because a lot of people talk about this, but it's one of those things that's kind of um, it's a little pet peeve of mine when it's the same thing of talking about oh here's the thing, here's the formula. It's mm. like well, no, it's <clears throat> that doesn't apply to everyone. Right. Um, in general, you know, I for me, I'm. 175 pounds about right now in your chest and just in my my earlobe and uh i i'm getting you know i'll probably get i don't know 35 40 grams of protein with my refeed meal and i seem to do well on that yeah but i mean you got to play and see how your recovery is you know if you're a smaller person you'll need less Mm. If you're bigger, you'll need more. Mm -hmm. So given those kind of blanket recommendations, and I know why you're asking that, Olivia, because I see it all the time, too. I see these questions. I mean, I see people saying this. You go online, you're like, well, what should you, well, you should have 30 grams of protein. Says who? You know, I mean, yeah. And where are you pulling that data? Where's the research? What were they looking at? So again, I'm really about individualized um, health. Mm Mm-hmm. And it takes some, a lot of people want, and Livy, you probably have seen this, a lot of people want a very prescriptive thing, like you shall do this at this time and yeah. this mm-hmm. amount and this thing. And that, that doesn't really work most of the time. Yeah. Um, really kind of tinker around with things and say, okay, well, let's get my carbohydrate. I'm feeling really good with this. Um, maybe uh, I didn't get enough protein. Maybe I'm a little sore and not feeling recovered. You know, mm-hmm. let me adjust that and, and play around with it in, yeah. as an individual. I mean, I'm not dismissing the question because it's a good one because it's out there constantly, but that's kind of my take on it. There's no, you know, people want, oh, well, Chris, give me the answer to this, yeah. right? You, Way to hit his pet peeve. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's a great question. Now he's it, being a little salty little bee. I am, a, well... <laughs> My daughter calls me a curmudgeon. That's a fancy way of saying salty bee. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> okay. So on a recovery day, we're still sticking with the, the food. Uh-huh. Um, what should um, your macros look like? You know, um, like what generally would you eat? Um, mm-hmm. Okay. So what, what would you eat on a, on a day off? I'll tell you what I do, Okay, which is completely different once what someone else may need. Remember I'll, we talked I'll about, tell you what I'll do after that. Okay. 
So remember we talked about with Brittany and figuring out what do you what do you do better on higher carb? Do you mm -hmm. do better on kind of protein, fat, and fiber? Right. For me, if I eat a whole bunch of um, you know starches or carbohydrate on a non-training day, I get fat. Mm. Um, I typically do more of a protein, fat, fiber type of thing on my non-training days for me because it works better for me. It's assuming I've done I've re done a good refeed after my training session before. So that's what it looks like. For for instance, like a, a a lunch would be like a you know, or dinner steak, an avocado, mm -hmm. right, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, or you know, if I want to do a salad that time, you know. Mm -hmm. But and then my training, my post training meal is when I really hit the carbohydrate heavy, and that mm -hmm. works for me. Yeah. But it may not work for other people. They may need a little bit more carbohydrate, and they may do well with a little more carbohydrate on their non training days. Right. I would say stop taking days off to this person. I was going to say, do you have any recovery days, Bill? Yeah. Sometimes I recover on Sunday. No one listened to Bill. Sometimes. <laughs> do not take this as medical advice. <laughs> Play the uh, intro again. Please. Uh, sometimes I recover on Fridays. Mm -hmm. Every other. But, um, so someone that trains a lot. Mm-hmm that has just one or two days a week where they're not doing a, cause we got to separate uh, heavy exertion workouts. And mm -hmm. just like we said, what is good to do on your recovery days is still go for a walk. Yeah. Still go for a light bike ride, still move. Mm -hmm. So almost every day, sometimes every day I am doing jujitsu. Mm-hmm. Let's say it's a throw a kettlebell workout in there if it's that time of year. Um, what would that? What should that? I mean, what would that look like? You think for that person? You have to feed your activity. Mm. You have to do exactly on those training days. You would eat like it's a training day. Mm -hmm. I would like to fast forward maybe five years from now if we could watch <laughs> you and see what you're doing then. You know, when you're in your mm -hmm. mid forties, mm -hmm. um, probably not going to maintain. Well. But I mean, you know, or at least the training intensity. Yes, exactly. So again, your activity levels, the bottom line is you got to feed your activity. You mm -hmm. just have to. Mm -hmm. And so adjust it for whatever you're doing. I train three days a week because that's all I can handle. Yeah. And so I do those refeeds and um, on those training days. Mm -hmm. And then otherwise I'm eating. Sometimes I'll intermittent fast. Sometimes I won't. It depends on how I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of in individual experimentation with how you're in, in of how you're feeling. But get some data to begin with if you're trying to figure out well, how much do I need for yeah? You know, pay attention to pay it. Pay attention. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Alrighty. Is that it today? Stop, stop taking breaks. Stop taking. There, yeah. There, there is a uh, uh, probably about four more questions, but I mean, how many? Four. Yeah, uh, we probably should limit it to maybe one. Pick, pick a juicy one. Yeah. Juicy Just something one. that's... Get down to the knee, greedy. Okay. Mm. Um, this one will probably be This will most fire us helpful. up. Oh, okay. So this person's asking, as a white belt, how can I best use my rolling time? Quantity, uh, as in how much, quality... Mm rolling with white belts versus higher belts and that they heard of another academy that does not allow this because of ego risk of injury. Doesn't allow what? the? Uh, I, I'm assuming the maybe either rolling. Rolling as a white belt? Or yeah, maybe. I've heard of that. Right. Yeah, I, I have some things on this, but I'd like to, I'd like you to lead this one because I think you have some good ideas on this. Okay. I'm going in this one cold. I like it. <laughs> um, so something that helped me progress quickly was in my roles, I, in the beginning, I shrank jujitsu down. So I intentionally tried to focus on some very specific things and try to not, not necessarily worry about Let's say if I'm on bottom, I, I 
or I'm, I'm just going to work on my guard, let's say. So I'm going to sit down. I'm not going to do the whole battle from our knees thing. Um, or if I'm going to work on passing and specifically a certain pass. So not just passing, but there's one pass I'm working on. I'm working on the X pass. Um, I'm working on a long step, whatever it is in that moment, knee cut. I'm, I'm not going to do those intermediary battles that can take three minutes of your round or two minutes of your round. Now, sometimes let's say the other guy wants to, you know, he's standing or he's on his knees too. He's not just sitting down. A lot of time when you're a white belt an upper belt will kind of give you that position. So it's yep. kind of easy. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of when I would probably choose it because I'm usually there's something on the top that I'm thinking I, I want to practice. There's something on the bottom in a guard position I want to. And then there's typically a submission I'm, I'm working on. Mm -hmm. So, so one, you know, there's three things I'm usually working on at any time. And so if it's an upper belt, I know I'm going to probably start on top and I'm going to just try to work on that. I'm also going to try to pay attention to every time so i i know the little bit of steps that I'm talking about when you're a white belt you know not all the steps because you don't remember everything but you know some of the steps to do your knee cut as i'm trying to do those i i'm trying to do it like a ratchet like click 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 so i get this grip okay i got that grip okay i push their leg you know their bottom leg to the ground i start to put my knee in the middle and then okay i need to get an underhook okay now i need i want to get my head to the mat so i'm doing all the little things that i remember in that moment i'm also taking an inventory when ugh, i cannot get this underhook what is he doing how do i do an underhook I'm trying to take an inventory of all those things. So I'm learning what they're doing. Why am I not able to do it? Or in uh, what that feeling is. Right. And, and then for that specific thing, then you go back, do some problem solving. Right. Yeah. And I, yeah. So and you can relate that to a, a guard position. Why mm -hmm. is this person, this upper belt or even a lower belt? Like how are they just constantly getting around my guard? I will also ask the upper belt after, or even if it's a if it's a white belt white belt crime, then I will ask them like, well, what were you doing to like just get around my spider guard? And then maybe they'll tell you. Maybe what they have is very not very informative, but it, it it's it's getting you to kind of think about it. And then and if an upper belt doesn't tell you, then they're a poo poo head. But uh, another thing um, is, I later on that night when I'm at home. I'm going to think about the roles again and I'm going to go in. Okay. Well, cause it's, I find when I think about the roles later after I, there's a, you know, there's some things missing, but I can kind of start diagnosing what was going on a little bit. And then I remember, Oh, I needed an underhook. I didn't even go for it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that he was defending it. I just, I didn't even go right, for it. Right. Um, so being a little bit more present and not trying to just win yes. the role is uh, a big thing. And then narrowing down what you're doing, what you're going for, um, and even being not being afraid to ask the person, hey, I'm really working on top. Can can I start mm -hmm. on top? Because mm -hmm. what literally half your round or a quarter of it might be you not even being able to get into the position that you're working on. And you're losing opportunity there. That's a really good answer. I found from my perspective, you know, people coming in, it depends on who they are, not everyone, but typically I see a lot of white belts being very comfortable. They just want to play their a top game. And I understand that. Mm -hmm. At the expense of developing a guard, a rule I use, actually, when I got to, I should have done this as a white belt. When I got to blue belt, I remember it's like, okay, I'm going to stop playing top game. Now, unless I was rolling with like a black belt or someone. Um, I wouldn't play my top game until I swept. It made me, and I'd get smashed constantly, mm -hmm. right? But it really helped me develop a couple good sweeps. 
and then I got it's like a reward to then I could kind of because I was you know really like most of us a lot more comfortable trying to play a top game on mm-hmm. people and not really because guard you know so much more familiar like, yeah ex- exactly get around the legs <laughs> exactly and try to so and also like you said condense it you know like have a f- very specific idea of what you are trying to work on mm-hmm. instead of going on YouTube every day and like well I want to do this really kind of cool looking submission it's like okay your time would be better spent working fundamental jujitsu doesn't mean you know ba- you know you should try to hone that mm-hmm. I'm working more and more as a br- and brown belt I'm sure you are too is trying to hone those fundamental things so they're as razor sharp as they can be and not making those, because there's so many little details to mm-hmm. even the things that look so simple. And, you know, sometimes um, Andrew will go over something that we've seen, you know, we've done hundreds of times. Mm-hmm. And then I'm like, there's this little detail that for somehow I never incorporated, right? Or, you know what I mean? Yeah, and sure. so getting those fundamentals and building it and, and having, like I was talking to a couple of folks um, a couple weeks ago, there are two white belts, they asked me similar, same question, what they should concentrate on. I said, look, you know, start work, like you said, work on a, if you're gonna play top game, work on a pass, work on, you know, how to transition to the dominant positions, hold them, and then maybe work one or two submissions from each position. But more importantly, at least half the time, you should start out playing guard. So that's kind of how, like, I think we're saying very similar things. And I think when it comes to the submission side, because when you're a white belt, you're just not going to have a lot of those opportunities. Because one, you just don't know how to finish a submission very, very Mm -hmm. well yet, or... You're just not in those positions a that's whole lot. Now, you might have the upper belt that's like I'm letting you get pretty deep on something mm-hmm. so they can work their deep submission escapes against someone that doesn't have a very sharp you know, Correct. knife in that game. Right. Um, which is something that is good to do when you're an upper belt is allow these lower belts to get deep on stuff so you can – really work your it's the same as like when you started to work on daily heva or new daily heva technique is you try it on a black belt you're not even going to get close to it like you got to kind of work your way up that's right do that with your submission defense also yeah and get rid of your pride of people <laughs> looking over and be like dang dude's got his back he's crushing bill over there like you know what i mean Cause, yeah we're training yeah, yeah yeah um yeah i think pretty pretty much saying the same thing on that Mm -hmm. that the shrinking down and i really like analyzing stuff later after now that doesn't mean i don't go into roles and just have fun like sometimes i try to just i will just kind of like i'm okay i'm not gonna play this i'm just gonna like do jujitsu and then see if it comes out Mm -hmm. you know when you're in the moment oh okay Mm -hmm. then we go for it right so it's almost like i'm mixing it in but if i'm really trying to hone a skill or a a certain technique or something like that then i'm i'm just going like let's say i knee cut someone because i'm going for knee cuts and now i'm in side control i will probably if i'm really working on it i'm not gonna fight the guard retention very hard right i'm gonna slow it down they can guard you know get their guard back and then okay i'm gonna mm-hmm, get another rep it's like doing situationals in your mind mm-hmm and uh, allowing yourself to kind of reset so you can go for it again. Right. See how they react different. Now that they know a little bit of what that feels like, they're going to yes. react differently because yes. they know they just got beat in that moment. Right. Um, yeah. Liv, do you have anything about about this? Well, Being a I, purple belt? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, some of the things that you've told me, and I even still do, um, is... If there's something that you notice that you gravitate towards naturally, focusing maybe on that particular mm. skill, mm-hmm. you know, as a white belt. There's something in your mind that you see or naturally can get a Kimura grip on someone. Right. Go after that. Mm-hmm. Or a knee cut. Your knee just comes up in the middle just naturally when you break their clothes guard. Run with it figure out what what can i do from this spot 
yeah, that was how you developed your knee cut. I would say is like we just kind of noticed that you naturally would put your knee up and like drive it over the hip. Mm -hmm. You didn't even know you're supposed to do that, but it was just kind of there, so you could just fit into that pocket. Yeah, and it was evident when I rolled with her. <laughs> I'd use like some reverse daily heva tricks on oh, her. Re <laughs> recently, <laughs> yeah, very recently. Yeah. It's very good. Her knee cut's excellent, and she's kind of good against reverse daily heva too. I that's know. That's what I play. Yeah. So she's seen the light. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I think to maximize your role, and that's, once again, this is if you're really trying to obtain a skill quickly, you don't have to do this. If you just want to go and roll, that's, that's fine. But if you're trying to get better in a short period of time. And, and also not every match is win at all costs. I mean, we're there to train. Yeah. Right. And, you know, sometimes I see that more often than not. And you see these, you know. It looks like a, I don't know, it looks like a dog fight. <laughs> yeah, and there's a place for it. And, there is. And absolutely, but if, once again, if you're trying to obtain and get better at something that you're not good at in the moment, that's, yeah. you, you know. Well, and you're going to fail when you start doing it. <laughs> yeah. You're yeah, just yeah. going to, but then yeah. eventually you'll start getting it, mm -hmm. and it's going to be well worth the effort. And it's something you brought up a little bit is, I noticed that brown belt is when the fundamentals really do start to get sharp. Yeah. Like that's, and I think about when I was a uh, lower belt and I was thinking about when I would go with brown belts, I was like, they just feel different. Well, there's certain like positions that they were basic. Like I remember Andrew Jang that he would. What'd it, you call him? Andrew. <laughs> okay. And <laughs> when he would, uh, <laughs> when he like would just be opening my guard or, or I would try daily heave or something. It was just positionally. Mm -hmm. It was so incredibly like structured. And then when he would start passing, it was slow. Yep. And there was just these fun. It was, it was incredible. And, and that's what I'm talking about. I think, you know, you go through those different phases and, you know, going back to honing those fundamentals right mm -hmm. now is really what I've been working on mm -hmm. as much as I can. So yeah. I think there's a lot that's you know, it's, it's nice to kind of circle back because, you know, you, as a blue belt and purple belt, you know, kind of developing a game mm -hmm. that you kind of like. Oh, I, I and I, I do. I know you threw a little shade at YouTube. I, I'll live on that YouTube. But you just got to be careful, especially as the white belt. Not saying don't look at Instagram and YouTube for stuff, but because sometimes I'll be drinking my pre-workout on the way to the gym and I'll see like a cool thing. I'm like, oh, if I get into that spot, if I can remember, I'll. I'll try it. But you have a scaffolding to build yeah, that on. Yeah, yeah, That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You have some very strong fundamentals. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> um, I think, was that the last question? Or at least yeah. for now? But for now. We'll have some others. Yeah. I do I do want to say one more thing, though. Do okay. it, please. So, it was interesting because Chris was talking about how, like, as a white belt, you were working more, like, uh, top. And then as a blue belt, you did more bottom game. Yep. But then for me, it was a little bit different because since I was only female, basically white belt, and all the mm -hmm. other females were upper belts or blue and above, mm -hmm. I was playing more bottom. And it wasn't until blue belt that I started, or even mid blue belt, that I started actually working on my top game. Mm. I don't know. I was just felt like sharing that. No, that but that makes sense though too. Yeah, yeah. You know, the the typical guys. And I'm saying guys yeah. for a specific reason mm -hmm. that I see as white belts that will play that top game are the ones that are, you know, they're athletic, they're strong, explosive, and they're looking at like, okay, we're at all costs. We're, I'm just going to, yeah. And they're going to play that, that top game. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense, you know, and you see people that are naturally smaller will gravitate and develop a really good guard. Yeah. And well, and if you kind of look at, at that is Olivia, one of her, best parts of her game it's not necessarily flashy i guess but is guard retention mm -hmm. your, your guard can be very hard to pass yep. so i think you know you you started with this foundation of defensive guard play yep because you're going against a bunch of purple belt females uh when you started and then as you started working your top game you're still working bottom but your foundation is bottom. So you, it's almost like you've been doing bottom the longest. Mm -hmm. So your retention is a little bit ahead of everything else in your game. So that's why you can, 
go with you know upper belts uh, brown belts and like have give them real fits on uh getting your guard passed well i would argue if you know a, a white belt that'd be something really good to focus on because i think it's mm -hmm. a real it's an excellent foundation instead of you know yeah to start with so yeah. i think that's a great way to go that's a good comment Olivia. It, thanks for if, sharing that it, but like you said if they're small then it's uh, people will smaller people will naturally kind of do that but the bigger people they will not they won't and then they'll get into a competition and someone yeah. like oh no and then <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah all of a sudden they're in guard and uh oh <laughs> right yeah exactly <laughs> yeah um anyway yeah cool that was a good little q a excellent yeah. thank ask, you ask the doc no, uh, you had some good ones too, man. Thanks, bro. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have Carrie coming on here in the next mm -hmm. couple of weeks. Any questions about testosterone replacement therapy, hormones, uh, thyroid, uh, ladies, if you got anything, um, it might not get answered in that exact uh, episode, but we'll start referencing it and putting it in her mind so we can talk about it. Yeah. Um, we're going to have Andrew on again. Mm -hmm. Phase two of the workout plan is right. coming. Um, yeah. And if uh, you guys have questions about literally anything, uh, what my hair treatment plan is, um, I'll let you know, give you my hairstylist number. And uh, yeah. Excellent. We can do it. Uh, grappling with podcast at gmail.com or just message any of the social media pages. Chris probably doesn't know how to answer messages yet, so don't worry about messaging him. <laughs> but I'm on Instagram now. But he's on the <laughs> IG, uh, that and Grinder. Okay, so why don't you just uh, <laughs> okay. throw our music on there and <laughs> we'll see you later. You'll pay for that.